Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Berean Baptist Church for this, our Sunday night service. We're certainly glad to have you in Out of the Heat. And so tonight, uh, not only do we have the Lord's Table at the end of service, but it is song request night tonight. But there are rules. Don't you hate rules? And here's what the rules are. It has to be on Jesus or salvation or the cross, but it has to do with Jesus, the gospel, salvation, the cross. It has to be on that topic. And so anyway, um, I know there's many, many songs in the hymnal, but we're just narrowing it down just a teeny bit because of the subject matter that we're doing with both in the sermon and with the Lord's table. So let's stand together and sing. Brother Carl's going to get us started off with a song here. Number 281, Jesus saves, amen? Amen. Sand, please. start to our singing here. We'll let our voices go and, and praise the Lord together. Let's have a word of prayer at this time. Ask God's blessing on the service. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, uh, we can be gathered together as a church family in a church home. And Lord, I thank you for really the great privilege and yet also the great seriousness and sacrifice, knowing that you died not only so that we could have a place in heaven, but you died for this church to exist. And Lord, what an, what an amazing sacrifice you have given for us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be ever thankful, ever appreciative, that not only have you given us yourself, but you've given us our brothers and sisters. You've given us a church family. And so we thank you for that as well. We pray that we would see your hand in everything, that you would hear us as we praise you, that you would hear our hearts as we remember carefully and solemnly a little bit later tonight, and that you would work through the preaching of the word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's how it's going to go. I guess you and I are alternating. Is that what's happening? You may be seated. Yeah, we're alternating where I'll lead a song, he'll lead a song, I'll lead a song, he'll lead a song. Does that work? That works. That works, he says. Very, very good. That, what do you go? What's the reason for that? It's called stamina. And so, but you see, Brother Carl's still standing, so I'm going to let him, I'll let him do the next one. I think he has enough stamina for one more there. And Brother Jim is request number one, it looks like, right there. He's got veto power. Okay. I'm not vetoing. What? 
527. 527. He was talking at the same That's time, right. so. I do that a lot. 527. And he says he's doing verse 2.
be a preacher. I thought you were going to be a singer, but now I'm really quite certain you're going to be a mountain climber. <laughs> so, okay, Darren, right here. Number 56. What is it? 56. Number 56, Brother Carl.
Liliana, I saw you right there. See, I'm looking at making it fair. This is a lazy eye. So, right there, Liliana. Two, three, four. Number two, three, four.
meet at high altitude. Why is the high altitude man up there? Boring. This one for Jerry. 303. Number 303, Brother Carl. The 303. <laughs> So we are going to implement summer entry procedures on Wednesday night. And what that means now, some of you, uh, you may need to come in the front door and that won't be obstructed to you. But for the rest of you that uh, you have no trouble going over the river and through the woods to the sanctuary, uh, we're going to open that northwest entry door right there. We're going to have you come in below instead of above because uh, one of the things we discover is air moves whether you like it or not. And you know when that door opens, a blast furnace is coming in. So, and once that happens on a super hot day, we, we can't cool it off. So we're gonna do that on Wednesday because we already have incredible confidence that it's gonna be hot on Wednesday. So anyway, just letting you know that's gonna take place. Also, if I were to point your attention to the foyer, you will see there's this big tub in the foyer. And in that foyer, there are foodstuffs in that big foyer. No, that is not for you, okay? There are paper towels and toilet paper in there. That is not for you either. This is not COVID. But what it is, is this is a gathering place. We are gathering things for, um, for Andrew and Megan's pantry. And so this is for the non-perishable food items. And so feel free to gather those. We'll be gathering those over the course of the next couple of weeks. And so just feel free to bring them in and we'll just want to take care of them as much as we can. For those of you who are wondering where we're at, um, we, are with, we are within $100 of the moving responsibility, within $100 hundred dollars okay now we still have uh, we still have the first month's rent that we want to take care of but I I've heard through the grapevine there's still some other funds trickling in so by midweek maybe we'll know better on that but anyway uh, the Lord is providing and uh, so anyway we're everything is just on track and on course well on our way and so we certainly pray, uh, praise the Lord regarding that. Again, tomorrow, my wife and I, we're leaving about 2.30 in the afternoon. We're headed to Hayden, Idaho. And if you want to hitch a ride with us, you most certainly can. We're going to take in a, a church service in Hayden, Idaho with Brother R. B. Olet. What a wonderful, wonderful man of God. God has taken care of him. Uh, God has uh, saved him from cancer. And uh, we're so grateful, and we're just really looking forward to see him. But you can come, you can come along with us. We, we'll let you. Um, I have room in the trunk. It's not a problem. And uh, anyway, we'd love for you to come if you can. So letting you know those things, trying to think if there's anything else uh, this week. And I think those really are the main. Say that again. FBI, Faith Bible Institute, starting Thursday. Anyway, there's still time to register. And again, that will be, uh, praise the Lord, downstairs. Aren't you glad we never had it upstairs? We never put it up on the third floor or anything like that. 
And anyway, that's going to be down in the fellowship hall. Feel free to come about 15 minutes early uh, to be able to get your class materials. And so just uh, want you to be aware of those things. Oh, yes, somebody gave a song request. That's number 296. 296, there's not a friend <clears throat> like the lowly Jesus. Let's sing together. There's not a friend.
paper over in Virginia to the church family. It says, I've returned from the field exercise and I'm going to complete three weeks of school and one more week of graduation practice. I want to thank everyone who sent me stuff for my birthday and the abundant amount of texts from you and all in the church family. So far, I've had a lot of fun, but this last couple weeks will likely be smooth sailing. Thank you so much for keeping me in your prayers. And of course, that is Jared over on the other side of the country right now. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and we are looking at verse 9. Uh, no. <sighs> thank you, thank you. Just... Give me, I just had a moment of what we call mental dyslexia. And so, anyway, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And let's stand uh, for the reading of the Word of God. And uh, we are going to have uh, <clears throat> a wonderful time in the Word together. You know, there, there is something absolutely fabulous about being on the winning side. There really is. And uh, there's something liberating about it. Uh, but there, there's a reason why, and it hasn't have anything to do not by works of righteousness that we, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy. But you know, you have to have the power to give mercy, and Jesus has that power. Isaiah chapter nine, looking at verse six: For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let us have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, please now use your word in our hearts. Help us to see you as you really are and to see your Son as he really is high and mighty and lifted up. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. While you're being seated, I'm going to call your attention to a couple verses in Revelation chapter 1 where Jesus gives um, a description about himself. And this will come up again in one of the other uh, parts of this. We are in part 5 of a seven part series here but in verse 8 Jesus says this I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the ending saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty but then again in verse 18 verse 18 I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and death these scriptures give implication regarding the great might of Jesus Christ in fact when we look at the term in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 it really is the idea of a warrior Jesus is our warrior, and he's more than our captain, he's our champion, and this is an important thing to understand. Often, and you know, we look at what Jesus did, and we look at what Jesus did on the cross, and, and you know, we have a, we have a concept in our life, and, and indeed, this often is true with us, and that is, we look at the loss of life as a failure, however, Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus lost his life. He gave his life. And that distinction makes all the difference that there could be. And so I want to talk about this concept of the mighty God that is found throughout Scripture that deals with the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to deal with every single scripture that deals with that tonight. And we will be out in three days. 
So we're not going to be able to do all of that, but I do want to highlight some things in the scripture regarding this. First of all, let's look at the mighty Christ of the Old Testament. And one of the best descriptions is in the book of Joshua. We're looking in the book of Joshua, and I'm going to give you the chapter number in just a second here. Oh, it would help if I was there. Okay, just a second here. Um, looking in Joshua, I will, I will be there in a split second. I found it. Joshua chapter 5. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 5. Look with me at verse 13. And it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, <clears throat> that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. I want you to think about that concept here. And I want you to understand that when we talk about the mighty Christ of the Old Testament, I want you to understand there is significance to the fact that the sword is drawn. And I want to point out to you that this is our God. This is our mighty Christ. The sword is not in his sheath. The sword is out because... He is ready to take action. And this is an important thing to understand. Um, sometimes people really do try to live their lives as if uh, God, for some reason in heaven, uh, needs, a, needs a prescription or needs therapy or needs a seeing eye dog or he's slow to move and he's slow to react. None of that is true. God is ready at an instant. And he's ready to act at an instant. And somebody once said this, we should never ever take God's permissiveness or God's long suffering as an act that he is not paying attention or that he doesn't care. He certainly does. Uh, sometimes I run into people and they have a real lackadaisical view about church. Well, God doesn't care when I show up. God doesn't care what I wear. God doesn't care about this. God doesn't care what I do. I went, wow, you serve a God who doesn't care. I just happen to serve a God who cares. And the reality is that when we look here, we see it says his sword was drawn. He was ready. And so because he was ready, Joshua thought, I better find out which side this person's on here. And so he asked the question. He said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Most wonderful answer coming from the divine. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Jesus says this as the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm on my own side. And that is very, very important to understand. It's always that way. God never looks at you and looks at another person and says, okay, I'll take your side or I'll take your side. God is up there, he's on the throne of heaven, he says, you better take my side. Wherever you are, you better figure out where I'm at, and you better take my side. And this is important, it was of course the Civil War question that a correspondent, um, correspondent presented to President Lincoln and says, do you think God is on our side? And he says, you're asking the question wrong. The question is whether we're on God's side. And so, this is true of Almighty God. But then there's also this as we go through. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And this is very, very interesting. Because we have this reality that Joshua realized that this person is the captain of the Lord's host and that he's in charge. And Jesus said, there's one other thing you need to know. I am more than just in charge. 
I am the mighty God. And so we have this reality, and we look here, and I find it interesting. I want you to notice something. He never gives his name. But you know who he is. And that's an important thing. He is the mighty God. I want you to think about that because that's coming up later. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So first we deal with the mighty Christ of the Old Testament and who he is. But then we deal with the mighty Savior of the New Testament. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1 and looking at verse 30. I find this so very, very interesting. Because you have that when the angel appeared to Joseph, that he said his name shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That is not the very first description that is given to Mary. And Mary is going to be the earthly mother of the incarnation. Look at Luke chapter 1, look at verse 30 here. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Now let me back away here, and, and let's do a little bit of a, a word study here. Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament Hebrew word, Yeshua, which means Joshua. So let me ask you a question. Was Joshua in the Old Testament a warrior? Oh, yes, he was. And so what you have is the Jesus here in the New Testament he is also going to be a warrior. And that is the very first message that is given to Mary regarding the person of Jesus Christ. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so think about this, you know, Mary most likely was a, a teenage young lady, but the very first description she's giving of the son that shall be born is he is mighty. And this is an important thing to understand. He's the prophesied conqueror here in Scripture. But let's go a little bit farther and look at verse 35. And it says this, and the angel answered and said unto her, <clears throat> The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And we have here this amazing thing, the bridge to humanity. And I want you to realize we understand our humanity, and we understand our human limitations but there's one thing that only the mighty God can do and that is put all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form only God could do that and people don't think about that that is an incredibly powerful thing and that is an incredibly mighty thing to think that you have someone on planet earth the word was made flesh and dwelt among us but that still was the same Savior and the same power that created the heaven and the earth. And the same power that created the heaven and the earth also poured the fullness of the Godhead into bodily form. And that's an amazing thing. And he wasn't 50-50. He wasn't half man and half God. He was all man and he was all God. Okay, and if you think about that long enough, your head will explode and we'll have to call the paramedics. But the reality is, is understanding how this shows the power of God and it shows the mightiness of what God is able to do, the bridge to humanity. But then you also have the mightiness of holiness and holiness is not a humble thing. Holiness is a powerful thing. Look with me at Hebrews chapter four. And looking at verse 15. 
Hebrews chapter 4, looking at verse 15, where the Bible talks about the person of Jesus Christ here on earth. In just one moment here. I got to swinging too much here, and um, I was momentarily disconnected. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's called power, folks. You know, we have a, we have a little issue with sin here. It's called tempted sin, tempted sin, tempted sin, tempted, fight it a while, sin, tempted sin, not tempted sin anyway. You know, we have a lot of problems here. You know, it takes the mightiness of holiness. Tempt, no sin, tempt, no sin, no sin, no sin, no sin, no sin. The mightiness of a pure and a holy and a powerful and sinless life. And it's the mightiness of holiness that was contained in Jesus Christ. And the only accusations they could, they could levy against Jesus was either false accusations or maybe a true accusation. Hey, you claim to be the Son of God. Yeah, thank you for that true accusation. But the reality is we have the mightiness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we have something else. Turn with me to John chapter 19. Book of John chapter 19. Because remember, Jesus did not lose his life. Jesus gave his life. It was his mission to give his life. And when he completed his mission, it was mission accomplished. And it was a victorious giving of life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is that atonement, and he gave his life, and it wasn't a failure. It was an absolute victory. Sorry, Mr. Pope so-and-so, that you said that, but the reality is the blood of Jesus Christ is victory. It is not failure. And so we look here, at as we look at John 19, verse 30, it says, When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed, up his head, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But the thing is, is people don't pay much attention to this. It is finished. They think, oh no, he failed. He gave his life. He says, I give up. It is finished meant I win. It is the Greek word that was used in Roman competition where the person who crossed the line, the word was something like to telestai, and it meant I win. It meant it's done. It meant I finished it. And that's what Jesus yelled out. In fact, the Bible says, you know, here you don't get the, the implication of it when you look here. It just says he said it is finished. But you read the other scriptures. He said he cried with a loud cry. He didn't say it is finished. He said it is finished. Amen. And everybody heard it. And this is the important thing to understand. We're dealing with the mighty God here. And we're dealing with a mighty act and a mighty activity. There was somebody who noticed. Maybe a lot of people wasn't noticing. Hollywood sure didn't notice. But somebody noticed. And that is in Mark chapter 15, looking at verse 39. And in Mark 15, verse 39, it says... And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he, let's start here, so cried out. Oh, really? What did he so cry out? It is finished! That's what he so cried out. And you know, the, the Roman centurion, who maybe wasn't paying too much attention, that got his attention. At that point, he looked up. And he said, when he saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. You know what? Nobody's, ro nobody's rolling the film. 
And because nobody is rolling the film, Hollywood, when they roll the film, they always make the death of Jesus Christ a failure. They always make it a thing where life was taken from them. They don't make it a thing of deliberation. But it was a thing of deliberation. And the centurion caught that. Went, huh. And not only that, we don't have the film rolling about how he died. And you know what? I sometimes, I have these little thoughts that roll through my head. And I kind of wonder if he yelled out, I'd like to find out in heaven and whether maybe because that got the centurion's attention and his head snapped up, if Jesus then looked back down at him. Maybe gave him a little wink. No, we don't know what happened. But whatever it is, the centurion went, I've never seen anything like that. Truly, this was the Son of God. He's the mighty God. And the centurion got that. You know what? And for the centurion to say that, I bet if we get to heaven, I think we're going to find that particular centurion in heaven. I think we're going to find that when we look at that. And so we have the mighty Savior of the New Testament and that was prophesied to be a conqueror and that God poured all his power into bodily form and that Jesus had the power to be holy. And he gave his life in a victorious way and he had a powerful life that was taken up. How do we know Jesus? Well, Jesus told us himself that was exactly what was going to happen. We look at John chapter 10. Book of John, chapter 10, verse 18. And as we look there, it says, no, he talks about, I lay down my life that I may take it again. It's pretty deliberate, don't you think? Verse 18, no man taketh it from me. Well, Jesus was nailed to the cross, okay? If you say, well, his, if his life was taken from me, refer back to rule number one. What did Jesus say? No man taketh it from me. It's all a plan. His plan. He says, I lay it down of myself and I have, what's that next word? Power. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. And so we have the fact that there was a powerful life taken up. Matthew chapter 28, we're looking at verse 5 here. Matthew 28 in verse 5, and it says, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. You know, how would you feel if all of a sudden you're walking somewhere, you're looking for someone, you're looking for something, and somebody you have never met says, I know why you're here. Kind of make you feel a little creepy for a second there, wouldn't you? As we said, I know why you're here says, ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. A powerful life taken up. And it's a place of authority. Jesus has been given a place of authority. Look with me, Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verse 2. Hebrews 12, looking at verse 2, where we say, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and where is he now? Set at the right hand of of the throne of God. He's in the place of authority. By the way, what did Jesus say? It is finished. You know what? You're not mighty unless you finish. He's mighty. He finished. And he's at the right hand of Almighty God. Okay, what's he doing there? Well, you see, we talked about the mighty Christ of the Old Testament. We talked about the mighty Savior of the New Testament. Now we're talking about the present and coming King. The King that is present and the King that is coming. And first of all, we have to understand that in the present, He is the powerful Savior 
and the power, and he's also the powerful intercessor. Hebrews chapter 7, looking at verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. How many of you would like to be half saved? No? 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 How would you like to be in the hereafter? I was saved for dr from drowning for 10 minutes and they let me go. Okay? I was um, ready to fall off a 12-story building, but that guy held on to me for about five minutes and then he let me go. How many of you like to be half saved? Do you realize religion convinces everybody they're only half saved? Think about that. They say, okay, there's somebody who did this, but now you've got to do this, 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 this. You're only half saved. Jesus didn't half save you. He saved you to the uttermost. You know why? Because a Savior who only half saves is not mighty. But Jesus is the mighty God. And that's what it says in 725. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's the powerful Savior. He's the powerful intercessor. He is working on it right now. Listen, he's already interceded for you today. Oh, pastor, if he's interceded for me today, you're saying that I had a bad thought today. Or that maybe I, maybe I snapped at a spouse today, or I did this, or I did that. Hey, I know you, you know me. You know, he's already interceded for us today. Sometime today, it's already happened. But he's always there to do it. And he's the uttermost Savior, not a partial Savior. He's a powerful Savior. He's the powerful intercessor. And he's the ultimate conqueror. He's the ultimate conqueror over two things. Look with me at Revelation chapter 19. Book of Revelation chapter 19. Remember I told you I was going to get back to something? I'm going to get back to something here. Revelation 19 verses 11 and 12. And it says, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew. You kind of like that, isn't that interesting? Okay, remember Joshua? Remember the captain of the Lord's host? What's his name? I don't know, but I know who he is. And when you see Jesus, nope, what's the name that no man knows? I don't know, but you're going to know who he is. And that's the reality when we deal with Jesus. What an amazing, amazing thing. He's the ultimate conqueror over evil. In this case, he's conquering evil. But he's also the ultimate conqueror over death. And you know what? It takes somebody divinely mighty to conquer over death. And when you look here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you're looking at verse 25, and it says, For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. How did Jesus destroy death? He's mighty. He's the mighty God. And then also in Revelation chapter 21, looking at verse 4. And I like it. You know, when you think of all the wonderful things about heaven and being there, and you think about the fact that when God describes heaven and describes the things in heaven, he puts everything in order. When he says this, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So one of the things that you know, there's going to come a day you'll never cry ever again. Never again. Never a sad day. Never a tear. But the very next phrase, and there shall be no more death there it is right there why is it there because he's the ultimate conqueror he's the mighty god and he conquers everything including death not only is he the ultimate conqueror he's the eternal rewarder 
The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, he says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so we have the mightiness of God, and we have the eternity of God, and we have the rewarder who is God. I always like this where it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And you see, I had a grandpa who, around Christmas time, I mean, he would, he would come running in the door. And he didn't have a Santa suit on, which is good. That'd probably be pretty scary to me. He didn't have a Santa suit on. But he would come running in and he'd have, a, he'd have the red bag. But you know, that red bag was full of gifts. What was happening? His reward was with him. And you know, it's interesting how it says, Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me. He's saying, I can't wait to give you your gifts. You know, I am anxious. To, uh, now, granted, um, I've seen some things this weekend that I, I never thought I'd see before. And you know, it's one thing for somebody being anxious to give gifts. But I have to admit, um, I saw one little three-year-old girl. I never ever saw a girl so anxious to get gifts in my life. Okay? I never seen somebody on a mission there to tear through those gifts as fast as I ever saw that before. That was amazing. But to think about the anxiousness of God, not in terms of worry, but excitement. Excitement to give you something. Excitement to end the sadness and to end the pain. And to end the emptiness. Because he's the mighty God. What an amazing thing that is. Let me close with this. We're going to turn to the book of Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah. Looking in the Old Testament. And you go, how do you get there? Well, you go to Malachi. Then you go backwards to Zechariah. Then you go backwards to Haggai. And then you're in Zephaniah. Turn with me. Just go backwards. Malachi, go backwards. Okay? Or if you were like me, a young man, I didn't know how to pronounce these things. I thought uh, Job was job. Everybody has a job to do. And, uh, and Malachi, I mean, it looked Italian to me, Malachi. You know, it looked to me kind of like Italian. Okay. Zephaniah chapter 3, looking at verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. And you go, and many times people just, they, they generalize this, and they think, okay, it's the mighty God, and it's the mighty God in the midst of me, okay? You know, and they're just kind of thinking of God in generic terms, and they're thinking of God the Father, but that's not the case here. Because I want you to notice a couple verses here. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. You know what? If you're going to hear God sing, I think you're probably going to see somebody who's maybe the, all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Look at verse 20. At that time will I bring you again, even in a time that I gather you. I will make you a name and praise, catch this, among all people of the earth. Okay? Now, granted, we're dealing with a promise of the nation of Israel, okay? Nation of Israel is gathered around all the earth. Is everybody praising it right now? Everybody happy that Israel's there? No, because this isn't the time. Here we're talking about the millennial reign is what we're talking about. But it's a name and a praise among all the people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. But the one who is in the town, and the one that's in the gathering is the mighty God. And his name is Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. And we thank you for your power. And Lord, sometimes because of the powerlessness of our own lives, we don't look at you right. We don't look at the power that you truly have. We don't see you for what you're able to do. We don't see you as the mighty God 
in everything that you have already done. And I pray, Lord, help us to know and to understand your might tonight. Every struggle, every problem that we have, you are more than able to take care of. Help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a song, it is in your hymnal. The title of the song is Only Trust Him. Only Trust Him. And... Um, we will find that really, really quick here. I'm going to give you a number here. That's number 163. 163. The God that we can trust, the God we can depend on. Let's stand as we sing this song. Come every soul, it says. God's mercy, what God's able to do. Let's sing this together. Come every soul. 